thank you for your offer. It's sure to be used to the country of God's kingdom. Forty four brother Father made the message I'd like to read a little bit. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here to read some of his word. And last week going home, I had a blowout on my car on my van. Around seventy mile an hour, thanks to God. He was able to get the van off the road and kept the traffic clear so I could change that tire and be here today. So I'd like to thank him for that. I remember somebody mentioned, you know, prayer up here for the deal with traffic, and I'm glad he mentioned it because I needed it last Sunday. This morning I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians, 12th chapter. He's here at Sunday school. You've already heard some of the verses I'm going to read here. All talking about the thorn in his flesh. We'll start with verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in body, I cannot tell, or whether out of body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which, is, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And of such, of such a one will I, will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I should not desire to glory, I should not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now will forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heard of me. And lest I shall be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Here Paul, talking about he's called to the third heaven. Whether it was in body or spirit, you don't know. Only God knows. Or what happened there? He was given all these visions and revelations, and so did and he was also given a thorn in the flesh that he would not be exalted above measure. They wouldn't think more of him because of these revelations than he ought to be thought of. He was just an apostle and just a man, just like all of us. And he was he shouldn't be thought more of. And so he asked for this to be removed three times. That it be depart from him. But the Lord said, My grace is sufficient for thee. As we read on here, he says, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities and reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He took pleasure in these things. You know, a lot of times we have a lot. You know, I had a flat tar last week. That's one thing I had going bad for me. And a lot of other things happened too. But I kept coming back to this verse. I studied my Bible and I knew the word enough. And I knew that if he didn't want to remove these things that happened, was happening to me last week, that his grace was sufficient for me, as it was for the Apostle Paul here in, in, in Corinth at that time. And that's what we need to do. We need to study God's word. And we need to make sure that we know it well enough so that all this comes back to our remembrance when we need it. And that way, His grace will be sufficient. If He does not want to remove it, we, we certainly need to pray. And we can ask for Him to remove it, but it may not be His will. It may be His will that He wants to help us because when we are weak, that is when the world sees us, sees Christ through us. He sees His strength through us when we are the weakest. That's when God shines the bright. When we're down in the world, like, well, why? I wouldn't even bother getting up. I just roll over and die. But yet we get back up because Christ is in us and gives us that inner strength. It's just like the story of the footprints in the sand. It's when it's when we're going through the worst time that we only see one set of footprints. And that's when Christ, Jesus Christ, was carrying us at this time for the time of the message. I'd like to welcome everyone here. I see we, we've got over a hundred again this week, and it's it's good that we're having that number. If you'll turn with me today in uh, Titus, the third chapter, <clears throat> where I want to speak from, 
You know, as I sit and listen to him, to him and the things that go on, and, and do we know when we're having afflictions or trials or whatever? And, and this week, early one morning, someone called, and, and I had a cow that had gotten out and was on the blacktop, and this person had already run and put it up for me. But I went and was looking to see where the fence was broken. And in doing so, I had this four-wheeler, and I got it about that deep in the mud, stuck, couldn't move. So before 7 o'clock, I'm back to the house saying, Donna, I need help in getting a tractor. And she takes about three or four steps. And this, I told her, I said, you're going to need boots because where we were, it was bad. She takes about three steps. And if you've ever walked in mud and you see your foot will come out and the boot's still there. And I said, honey, don't you know how to walk in the mud? Much to her dismay. So she had already taken her boots off and she's just walking barefoot. And I go about 50 feet and what happens to me? <laughs> There's my boot and I'm over here. And she says, honey, don't you know how to walk in the mud? And I said, well, God's trying me today. So we need to know, you know, when we get in those situations, if we can laugh about it, we're better off. And if we can realize that Satan will try to get a hold of you and cause problems, uh, it helps those trials go a little better. Um, in the third chapter of um, Titus, Paul has written this letter to him, explaining to him what he wants him to do for the congregation. And if we go back up into the second chapter, in the 13th verse, <coughs> excuse my voice, it says, Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. He's talking about the Christians when he's talking about peculiar people. Because even in that time as it is today, it is peculiar to do the things that are in the gospel because it is in the minority today to do those things. In chapter 3 it says, Put them in mind, talking about these peculiar people, to be subject to principalities, to powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Today we have laws and ordinances that we have to follow. And as Christians we have to follow those. We have to obey our leaders, we have to obey our magistrates, and we have to obey those elders and those that rule over us in our church. This rule that we have keeps us in the position or keeps us in the boundaries of following the law or following the gospel. And that's where God wants us to be. And it says that when the Spirit to be ready to obey every good work. So when the Spirit calls us, we need to be ready to do a good work not in opposition to the law or to the gospel. In Romans 12 and 11, it tells us not to be slothful when we're called upon, but to be fervent in the Spirit serving the Lord. So many times we sit and think, well, you know, if I see something that needs to be done, I'll wait and let somebody else do that. And usually there is somebody that will pick up the load. But I want to explain to you that whoever picks up that load will also pick up that blessing for doing what the Lord had for them to do. Someone else will receive what we should have. And he's talking about their being ready. In verse 2 it says, To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all people. Speak. When I sit and think about James 1.26, it says that if any man seem to be religious and bridle not his tongue... But to see his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. We can be the best person in the world and do everything that we're supposed to do, but if we're not bridling our tongues, we sang the song this morning, angry words, oh, let, let them never. We can be saying things about people, being saying things that we don't need to be saying, and our religion is in vain. It says that, that means it's empty. It's nothing. And that's not the situation that we want to be in. In Proverbs 17 and 19, it says that he that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. When we are spreading gossip, 
Do we only spread gossip about people we don't know? Because we might not want to hurt our friends, but we'll tell gossip on somebody that we don't know. But would we want that same gossip told on us if it was about us? And that's what he's saying there in Proverbs, that we can, we can cover that transgression or we can spread it and repeat it. And Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Are we malice in the way that we talk about others? Are we meek? Are we brawlers? Are we wanting to cause problems? Are we quarrelsome? Are we gentle to others? And would others that really don't know us or maybe meet us for the first time realize that there's something different about that person? They're peculiar. They must be a Christian. Or would we fall into the net with everybody else and no one could ever know in talking to us a little bit that we too were a Christian? We need to ask ourselves that question. In verse 3 it says, For we ourselves also are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. He's talking about the church here, and he's telling Titus, you need to put these people in mind of these things. We shouldn't forget our past lest we repeat it. We should pray to God that he makes us aware of these things, and he is through the scripture today, he's telling us these things, that we might be doing something wrong, and that we stay in word and study, and that we pray to him constantly and asking him for help. Because there was a time when we were in a foolish state, and some still are today. We learn through the Word. We have to remember that the difference in a Christian is that we are saved by grace. The only difference is we're saved by grace. It talks about being disobedient, and that's simply doing what God doesn't want us to do. He wants us to be obedient to the gospel. And how can we be obedient to it if we don't study and try to figure out what it is he wants us to do? But then even sometimes when we know what it is we're not supposed to do, we still do those things. We rationalize it. We make some kind of excuse. Well, it's all right if I do this because I act a little better over in this area. We can't be disobedient to God. Deceived. You know, that word haunts me. Because it bothers me a lot of times, am I doing what I need to be? And I, and I hope that's where God wants me, to always second-guessing myself to think, am I doing what the Word says? Am I following what it says? Because so easily can Satan deceive us and make us think, well, yeah, you're doing the right things, and you're okay, and everybody likes you, and this, that, and the other. But is that what God wants? Maybe I've done one little thing over here, disobedient, and not fulfilling the entire gospel. We need to ask ourselves that question. Is what we're doing correct according to the word? Serving divers, lust, and pleasures. You know, the world today is full of divers, lust, and pleasures. There's so many things that we can do. There's so many things that just entertain us. There's so many things that give us pleasure that go against what God has set forth. And we sit and do that stuff anyway. And when we're doing that, we're going back to being deceived because we think we can get away with it and we're going back to being disobedient to God. Sin has a pleasure. Cannot argue with that. The scripture tells us that. But one day, that season is going to be over. One day, you're going to have to be accountable for all the pleasures and all the lusts and all the uh, things that, the, that we have served. There's going to be a day that we have to account for those things. And life will end and will you have made it right with God before that season is over and before life ends? Malice. That is people that enjoy hurting other people either in word or in deed. Maliciously trying to say something about somebody to cause them or to inflict pain or to inflict injury to them. We just Some people just have fun doing that. And it's not understandable, but it is the way of sin. Envy. You know, envy is a waste of time. All it does is drags you down and it prospers nothing. And I sit and think about Cain and where it got Cain. The envy that he had and what it led him to. What is it ever going to prosper us to envy somebody else? We sang a song this morning about counting our blessings. 
And we need to do that. Maybe we don't have something that somebody else has, but maybe there's a lot of things we have that somebody else doesn't have. Maybe we have that indwelling of the Spirit. Maybe we don't have, as you look at the words in that psalm, maybe we don't have monetary things that somebody else has, but maybe we have family, maybe we have peace, and maybe we have contentment, and maybe we have a hope of spending eternity with God in heaven. Hateful and hating. I looked up these terms in the dictionary, and it says detestable, offensive, obnoxious, repulsive. These aren't glamorous terms. And we don't need to live in that mode because we're not only dragging ourselves down, but dragging others down. And it's simply a bad attitude. And I think about the word hate in 1 John 3.15. It says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. See, we're going back to that deceived. We think we can do everything, but we still want to hold on to that hate we have for somebody. But Satan is deceiving us because it says right here, hath no eternal life abiding in him. So we need to search our mind and our body and our soul to say, do we have hate for somebody? And what is it? And I need to get rid of it. Verse 4, it says, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, you know, God took pity on us, and he gave his son for us, and that's when he knocks at our door, and he says, I want to help you. I want to show you your error. I want to show you where you're not living life the way that I want you to do, that you're being deceived and you're being disobedient. And that's when we hear that small voice and say, come in to me, and he makes it known to us that we need to change. And that's when we need to sin, seize that opportunity because there is something better. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That says it right there, that it's in our hearts to give the light of knowledge, to make it known to us what we need to do. On to verse 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Nothing that we do could ever justify Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Nothing that we could ever do would ever want the gift that he's given to us. It's because it's mercy of Jesus Christ that was planned long before the world was created, that there would be an avenue, a way of escape for us. Mercy is God making us aware of our sins and letting us know that we're in that state. Mercy is telling us that we need to repent. Now, he's not only talking to Christians, he's talking to those that are sinners too. This is God saying, he's showing you your lowly estate, and he's saying, let me help you for free. I'm going to do this for you for free because I've already paid the price for you. You see, Satan will deceive you and he'll say, you don't need to change. Isn't life going along good? Of course it would for you. You don't have to account to God. You don't have that on you every day thinking, you know, I need to change. I need to do better. I might be gossiping and, I, and, and if I hate, I'm going to go to hell. Those things, you're not discerned with those things because Satan is the greatest deceiver. Satan will tell you that you're not good enough to become a Christian. All my life, if I had to tell the things that I've done, and in my mind I know the things that I've done and how shameful I am, that's what Satan wants you to believe, that you can't become a Christian. He is the great that he tells you that no one has ever been as bad as you've been. Why would Christ want you? Why would he want something like that? But let me tell you, in Romans 5 and 20, it says, Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. You see, God is bigger, God is more powerful, and he can overcome that deceiving. And I go back to the time when Moses said, Who do I tell them that you are? And he said, Tell them, I am that I am. That's powerful. He has more power than Satan. 
He has the power to forgive you. He has the power to change your mind and make you think in a different way. What makes you want to stay a sinner? I ask you that question today. In Romans 2, 4, it says, there, Or despisest thou the riches of goodness and forbearance and longsuffering? Not knowing, here's the part, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. That light that shines into your heart is out of the goodness of God, that he is forbearing, that he is long-suffering. He's waiting on you as a sinner to come into the fold today. That's why he's waiting. That's why he's long-suffering. Because he doesn't wish that everybody would perish, but that everybody would have a right to eternal life. In Romans 1.16 it says, For I am not ashamed. See, sometimes people are ashamed. But it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, that saving grace, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But you have to believe. And you go, oh, well, I believe, but you have to follow. You have to believe that God is and that he will save you. And it talks about there about the washing of the regeneration. In 1 Peter 3.21, in verse 20, it's talking about the water that, that saved Noah. In verse 21, it says, The like figure wherein to even baptize, or baptism, does now also save us. Baptism saves us today. We're not saved until we're baptized. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not just that you're washing yourself, okay? But the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're being baptized because Jesus could not be held down in that grave. He couldn't be held by death, and he overcame it. And when you come back up out of that watery grave in baptism, you can't be held down by sin. You can live eternally with Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. And at that time, we receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit that tells you, look, today you did this, and you shouldn't have done that. That's the spirit that says you're about to get in trouble. And it all comes to us through the word. As we study the word, that's how that spirit talks to us. It's like you know gibberish, but nobody else does. When you become a Christian, God can talk to you in a way that a sinner can't understand. Because he makes it known to you through the word. And you can listen and do the things that he would have you to do. The washing and the indwelling is what sets us apart as Christians. That's what gives us the strength we need, the sustenance to live in our life, spiritual life. It makes us alive and it cleanses us from the past. He says, I forget those sins and I remember them no more. Satan will bring them back to your remembrance. But he says, I forget them as far as the east is from the west. You're cleansed from that. In verse 6 it says, Which he shed upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He shed on us abundantly. He had mercy and grace for us abundantly. He doesn't have to keep going back and giving it to us. He gave it to us then. Enough to take care of us if we will do what we need to be doing. Because of what Jesus has done, we can become benefactors. We have the hope of eternal life with him. We have the hope, as we talked about in Sunday school today, about prayer, that when we need him, we know he's there. We're calling on a friend. We're calling on somebody that we know will be there each time we call him. When we need strength, he'll be there. When we need wisdom, we can ask him, and he'll give us wisdom as well. Verse 8 said, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. He's saying it's the truth. This is a faithful saying. It is true. You know, Jesus said, if it were not so, I would not have told you. Jesus wouldn't lie to us. He told him, he said, I've gone to prepare a place. He said, and if that wasn't the truth, I wouldn't have told you it that way. Paul says we need to repeat these things. It says to affirm constantly. How many times, I, and I sat and thought this morning as I studied this, that, it, that and, and some men, but mostly ladies, that when you cook something, 
that you don't even have to go back and get the little recipe card out because you know it. Now, if it's something maybe you made one time and you make it every 10 years, you probably go back and get that little card out of the cabinet because you can't remember if it was a quarter or a teaspoon or a tablespoon or this or that. But if you make it all the time, and, and you know, something that's kind of common here is cornbread. Everybody's got their own little cornbread recipe, and you got it in your mind, and you know you don't even have to go to the cabinet and get that thing out. Paul's saying that we need to stay in this Word so that we know what it says. So that we know when we face trouble what it says. That we need to constantly affirm these things for ourselves. And that we need to be renewed constantly by the Word. <clears throat> Why? Because it keeps us sin free. Why? Because it might help us to bring others into the fold that when somebody else comes to us and says, I've got this problem, we know what to tell them about the plan of salvation. So that we and, we, and there's nothing wrong with going and getting the Bible and saying, you know, right here's what it says in Acts. You know, it tells us about this and, and going to these different verses. There's nothing wrong with that. But it also helps us to continue to do the right thing. That if we're constantly reaffirming ourselves in the Word, that we know what we need to be doing. Because the world has a way that seemeth right, but the end is destruction. We need to be going in a way that we know is right, that matches the gospel. It says it's profitable to a man. We talked about in Sunday school this morning that it enriches us, that it encourages us to be doing those things which are good. And at the end, there's going to be a reward for us of eternal life. Verse 9 says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. I have different people coming to me sometimes with these different questions, and I've got one gentleman coming to me, and he says, At what second do you lose your salvation? He wants to know at what second. It's a foolish question. This person doesn't even believe they can lose their salvation. But they keep coming back with that. And it says to avoid these things. It's not doing anything for God. It's not glorifying Him. It's not building Him up. And I remember one time, <clears throat> years ago, I used to be a salesman and sold industrial parts. And I went to this large trucking firm. And the owner comes to me and he says, if you've got grade eight lug, grade eight lug boats, he said, I'll buy a boatload off of you. Well, grade eight is a stronger strength than a grade five. Okay. I didn't know, so I get my big catalog out and I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm calling, I'm doing everything I can do because this man's going to buy all kinds off of me. You see the dollar signs. He walks off because it's taking me so long trying to find these and find the mechanic walks around and he says, hey, you know, nobody makes great at it. You're not going to find it. People will do those things to you to cause you trouble, to cause you strife. And it doesn't profit anybody. I've heard Brother Dan say about if God can do anything, can he make a rock so big that he can't pick up? What would it glorify him? People will tell you those things and ask you questions, and they've got their own strife, their own problems. The reason they're doing that, and he's telling Titus, let's not get caught up in those things. Let's not have strife, and let's not have uh, things like that going on in the churches that you're going to be uh, developing there. It's unprofitable, and the smartest answer to tell them is, I don't know. In 10, it said, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. When somebody comes to you with this kind of stuff, you can't just keep feeding on it, because that's what they're doing. They're feeding on you. A heretic, according to the dictionary, is one who differs in doctrine from his church, or one who holds opinions contrary to customary views. He said, reject them. Quit worrying about it. Don't fool with them anymore. Doesn't mean that you can't go off and pray and hope that maybe they see the light somewhere someday and that they get away from that. It's silliness. It's not helping anybody. It says, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. He's giving Titus the answer to these questions before that he's ever going to meet with them. Subverted means to overthrow, to destroy, or to undermine. And there are those that want to undermine the well-being of others. And he said he has condemned himself, ladies and gentlemen. 
reject you. If they're not wanting to be building up and be a part of something good, reject them and let them, they've already condemned themselves. He says, and when I send Artemis unto thee, or Titmus, be diligent to come unto me, to Nicopolis, well, I can't talk, to Nic well, Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter, bring Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on the journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. He goes back here in this verse and he says it again, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. We as Christians need to have fruit. If we don't have fruit, we're dead. We need to maintain good works. We need to be as Jesus was going about doing good. And that's what he's telling Titus here. And that are with me, all that are with me salute you. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. My question to you today is, are you maintaining good works? Are you going about doing good? Are you a heretic? Are you subverted? If so, we need to change our ways. Have we ever started on that path? Have we decided that we need to change our life? Has God shined that little light through into our hearts and said, I've got goodness for you. I want things for you. Come and be with me and it's free. The price is already paid. The question is, have you been washed in the blood? Have you allowed Jesus Christ, as we partook of these emblems today, the sacrifice that he made for us, have we sacrificed to give up sin and to follow him? I ask you to think of these questions as we sing 613 as Hall's Handed.